Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be together again to worship this morning on this, well, <laughs> I don't actually know what kind of morning it is. Yesterday, it was dreary and gray and kind of cold in the morning. Today, well, whatever the weather, it is truly good to be here with each other. Situated in our separate houses and homes, to be sure, but nevertheless gathered as a people who share our faith in God, gathered in our love for each other and in our desire to follow Jesus as people of the resurrection. We gather to encourage each other in our faith, in the God about whom it is written, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. This morning, if you happen to arrive <laughs> and for worship in time, you saw uh, two candles burning there on the pulpit representing the joy we bring this morning in celebrating new life. Earlier this week, son Ian Gregory Godshock Rohr was born Monday, April 13th, to Megan Blank and Jesse Rohr, and we celebrate with Steve and Lori Blank as grandparents and with great-grandmother Martha Blank. And then on Tuesday, son Caleb Stephen Zetz was born to Cassie and Andrew and the word is from all that they are doing well so we rejoice in this new life. So we come to worship today the giver of life, the one who sustains us through all that life brings as we celebrate together this morning. Morning has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the Perhaps this year especially it can be hard for us to remember that Easter is a season, not just one day in the year. And so today we observe the second Sunday of Easter and experience its invitation to us to continue to ask ourselves, what does resurrection life look like these days? And how might we practice resurrection in our daily lives just now. In this particular Easter season, let's find ways to remind ourselves that God's grace and goodness are always with us, are always available to us, 
perhaps a resurrection habit that we will want to further cultivate during these days is to regularly notice and name and give thanks for what we are experiencing as good along with these things that are hard and offer us such challenge. One of the good things I think many of us are drawing strength from at this time is knowing that on a morning like today, many of our Salford friends are gathered with us, experiencing together, participating together in this time of worship. In those first week or two Sundays of our Facebook live worship, some of you sent pictures of yourselves or your families to Maria and me, showing yourselves um, sitting there in your homes, watching the worship service, participating along with us. And that was such a boost to our spirits. So we got thinking that many of us would really enjoy seeing each other in that way. And so here is a special invitation, a, a small resurrection practice for you to consider just now. If you're willing, um, take a picture of yourself, your family, whoever you're with this morning as you are watching the service and then send it in to us at the office sometime this week and we'll see what we can do uh, to share with all of you some of the joy that we had experienced in seeing those kinds of pictures. In those first resurrection days, Jesus came looking for his disciples wherever they were. Sometimes he found them in a room behind a closed door. Sometimes it was walking along a road Sometimes it was at the edge of the lake shore. Jesus continues to come searching for us, desiring to meet us wherever we are. And as in the song that you're about to hear, O oh Lord, with your eyes you have searched me, kindly smiling, have spoken my name. May we keep watch these days for the risen Jesus searching us out, looking for his kind smile, listening for his voice, speaking our names.
kids, it's time for children's time, so get a little closer to the TV or your device or whatever it is, because we're going to be reading a book, so you're going to want to see the pictures. While you're moving, I want you to know that today we're going to be talking about community um, and what community means and what community can be. Um, so in my story today, it's called A Sick Day for Amos McGee. And in the story, Amos is a zookeeper, and he goes to the zoo every day, very dependably, to help take care of these animals. That's his job. And then one day, Amos McGee gets sick, and he can't go. So I want you to pay attention and see what the animals do as part of the community to take care of Amos. So our story is called A Sick Day for Amos McGee. It's written by Philip Seastead, illustrated by Aaron Eastead. I wonder if they know each other. A sick day for Amos McGee. Amos McGee was an early riser. Every morning when his alarm clock clanged, he swung his legs out of bed and swapped his pajamas for a fresh pressed uniform. He would wind his watch and set a pot of water to boil, saying to the sugar bowl, a spoonful for my oatmeal, please, and two for my teacup. Belly full and ready for the workday, he'd amble out the door. Every day, Amos waited for the number five bus. Next stop, City Zoo, the bus driver would call. 6 a.m., right on time, he'd reply. Amos had a lot to do at the zoo, but he always made time to visit his good friends. He would play chess with the elephant who saw and thought before making a move run races with a tortoise who never, ever lost. Sit quietly with a penguin who was very shy. Lend a handkerchief to the rhinoceros who always had a runny nose. And at sunset, read stories to the owl who was afraid of the dark. One day, Amos awoke with the sniffles and the sneezes and the chills. He swung his eggy legs out of bed, curled them back again, and said, Ugh, I don't think I'll be going to work today. Meanwhile, at the zoo, the animals waited and waited for their friend. The elephant arranged his pawns and polished his castles. The tortoise stretched his legs and limbered up. The penguin sat patiently all by himself. The rhinoceros worried that his allergies were worsening. worsening. The owl perched atop a tall stack of storybooks, stretch, scratching his head with concern. Where is Amos? The animals wondered. Later that day, they're leaving the zoo. Where are they waiting? <laughs> Hooray! My good friends are here! The elephant prepared a game of chess. Amos thought and thought before making a move. I'm too tired to run races today, said Amos to the tortoise. Let's play hide and seek instead. The tortoise hid inside his shell. Amos hid beneath the covers. Amos yawned. I could use a nap. The penguin sat quietly, keeping Amos's feet warm. Achoo! Amos awoke with a sneeze. The rhinoceros was ready with a handkerchief. I'm beginning to feel much better, thank you, said Amos to his friends. He swung his legs out of bed. Perhaps we'll share a pot of tea. Amos wound his alarm clock. It's getting late, he said. After all, we have a morning bus to catch. So Amos said good night to the elephant, and good night to the tortoise, and good night to the penguin, and good night to the rhinoceros. And good night to the owl, who, knowing that Amos was afraid of the dark, read a story aloud before turning out the light. The end. So you know what the animals did? They found a way to help Amos and cheer Amos up.
and be with him when he wasn't feeling well. And if you think about what Amos was doing, Amos spent time with each animal in a little bit of a different way. You might be like that with your brothers or sisters or your mom or your dad. You probably play different with your mom and your dad than you do, say, your grandpa, or maybe a little different than you do with your friends. So you can kind of think about that too. Um, today, your emails, your parents got an email from church, and on the link on that email is some coloring pages, some for you and some for your parents or your siblings if they want to color too. Um, we're going to invite you to um, switch things around. Sometimes our community would do things for you in some ways and make crafts for you, and so this time it's a chance for you to, get make, to make something bright for others if you would like to. You can color these pictures and you can hang them in your windows for neighbors to see. Um, and if your neighbors are hard for neighbors, if your windows are hard for neighbors to see, I invite you to fold those up and mail them to your grandpa or your grandma or a teacher or a friend who could use some cheering up. Love you all. Bye. We too can offer ourselves in many different ways to be community together. We are grateful for and celebrate the ways each one contributes to our life together and our mission in the wider world. Thank you to so many of you who have continued to find ways to contribute to the work of our congregation during these weeks, sending your checks, um, using the automatic withdrawal system, stopping by the church or calling Brad to use the kiosk, using the new link to make online contributions. Your generosity is such a gift in this time. And as these COVID weeks stretch on, we become increasingly aware of growing needs in our community and beyond. We are especially aware of the needs of our brothers and sisters in the South Philadelphia and Allentown churches, where many are struggling with the most basic of needs for food and shelter. For any of you who are able to help, please see this week's newsletter for a description of our congregation's commitment and hopes for being able to take part in alleviating this distress in some way. And now let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for gifts that belong not to us alone, but to all our sisters and brothers since they too are created in your image. Let their need become our need. Let their hunger become our hunger and grant to us also a portion of their pain, so that in sharing ourselves, we discover the Christ who walks with our brothers and sisters. We pray in the power of your resurrection. Amen.
Let us come before God in confession. God of love and justice, we long for peace within and peace without. We long for harmony in our families, for serenity in the midst of struggle, for commitment to each other's growth. Yet we confess that we are often anxious. We are not willing to take the risks and make the sacrifices that love requires. Look upon us with kindness and grace, O God. Lead us and empower us in our homes and in all the world. Show us how to walk in your paths through the mercy of our Savior. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now. Dissolve like snow, the sun.
1 Peter 3-9 through What a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have him, this Father of our Master Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven, and the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through the suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have display on as evidence of his victory. You never saw him, yet you love him. You still don't see him, yet you trust him with laughter and singing. Because you kept on believing, you'll get what you're looking forward to, total salvation. Matthew 28, 5-10 The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where they laid him. Then go quickly and tell the disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there. This is my message for you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. They will see me there. Hi everyone, it's good to be with you this morning. I'm here in my office trying to get used to the fact that I'm preaching to a camera and I can't see all of your faces but I have some things that I really want to talk with you about, and that makes it a little bit easier. So I'll do my best. I wanna start by remembering last week, partly because it helps to start there as we move to where we are now, but also because I have really been dwelling on that Easter service all week. As we planned the service, I didn't know what we'd be feeling or needing or ready for by Easter Sunday. Would we really be ready to accept and enjoy the resurrection? We didn't know. I didn't know. But at least for me, that celebration of the resurrection was exactly right. Those photos of the flowers and sunrises Mateo was clapping along to the guitar and mandolin music. It was so joyful. Nothing that happened in that service took away the current pain, but it turned out, at least as far as my own heart was concerned, the joy of Jesus overcoming death was as deep as ever, maybe even deeper. So here we are with the music of Easter still ringing in our ears, and we're going to keep singing Easter songs because the season of Easter is even longer than the season of Lent. It's 50 days. It's a whole season to celebrate the resurrection, to hear stories of those early days of people's response to the resurrection, and to bring that powerful story into conversation with our world today. And there is a lot that our days and the resurrection days might have to say to one another. Given the pandemic that we are in and the social and economic ripples that it's having, I'd imagine our current days would jump into the conversation first. Who do you think you are, our current days might say to the resurrection. 
The coronavirus is now the leading cause of death in the U.S. And that's not to mention all the countries without advanced health care or sanitation. How can you say that God has triumphed over death when there is so much death all around? Death in detention centers, for refugees, for people isolated from their loved ones. Not to mention other deaths of hope and opportunity that are happening all over the place. I imagine our day saying, death must surely have the upper hand. But the resurrection already knows this. The resurrection is really no stranger to death, isolation, hopelessness. It doesn't contradict what our day is saying. It just lays out its story right in the middle of our story, right alongside the human story, as it did that very first time. It turns out those who first heard the Easter message needed it as much as we do, maybe even more. Those early weeks of the Easter se- these early weeks of the Easter season, we share a couple stories of those first reactions to the resurrection. One we heard last week, and then again today. It's from Matthew 28. It's Jesus' first words to the women who discover the empty tomb. They are terrified. They've just gone through the most harrowing weekend of their lives. And then they've seen an angel. Can you imagine what they must have been feeling? And another one, which we didn't hear, but which may sound familiar to you, is from John 20. It starts with the disciples huddled inside with the door locked for fear of the coronavirus. Oh, oops. I meant fear of the religious authorities who had killed Jesus and might come after them too. They were scared, and with good reason. Their leader was dead, so they thought. Everything they had hoped for had suddenly ended in pain and destruction. They were going to need to find a new normal. And Jesus' resurrection did not take away their pain either. Their fear of the Jewish authorities, the grief and exhaustion, of the past few days, or even what their little movement of Jesus followers would suffer through in the coming years. But it brought hope and joy alongside it in ways that enabled them to be God's people in ways that they had never even done before. So what is Jesus doing in this moment of fear that they're experiencing? The first story we heard from Lisette just now has Jesus comforting the women first. Do not be afraid. First he comforts them, and then he gives them a job to do. They need to go and tell the disciples to go to Galilee to meet Jesus. Go, he says. You're in charge of sharing the good news with them. In John, it's the same. Jesus' first words to those scared disciples in that locked room were words of comfort. Peace be with you. Peace. And in the next breath, he sends them. As the Father has sent me, he says, so I send you. And then he breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. They're not only sent They are empowered with the very power of Jesus himself to do these things. This context of fear, isolation, and unprecedented experiences is exactly where Jesus meets us. And it's exactly where the Jesus-following community is most needed in the world. And the best, most comforting part about this is, this is the place, this place where we are now, is exactly what Jesus equips us for, to be the body of Christ, 
in a world of fear. Hallelujah. The junior and senior high have been doing some Bible studies over Zoom these past weeks. The junior high are reading through Matthew, which was part of the agreement when they got new Bibles a few months ago. And the senior high are studying James right now. James 1.27 says this. This is from the message. Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father, is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from the godless world. So caring for one another and ourselves is exactly what it means to follow Jesus. Matthew 5, which are Jesus' words, say, You're here to be salt seasoning, and you're here to be light both meant for the benefit of others. In caring for others, we experience God and point others to God. I've been thinking about what this means for us right now, and I have a few ideas. The first is one that you may have already read about in the newsletter. In this moment of fear and loss, we can be the body of Christ right now, by providing for one another. We are all doing that in a very important material way right now, because the Salford Board decided last week to contribute $12,500 to the Eastern District and Franconia Conference Shalom Fund to support churches in meeting the needs of their congregations and communities. Brooke Martin, who is the children's ministry director here at Salford, also works for the conference, and she's going to tell us a bit more about the Shalom Fund. Hi, Salford community. This is Brooke Martin. I was asked to share a little bit about uh, my work right now with Eastern District and Franconia Conference. Um, At this time, I am working and helping to find, locate, and secure and move food from wherever it may be, wherever it is found, to where it's needed most. And those places include Ripple Church in Allentown, Ripple Community Inc. in Allentown, Crossroads Community Center and Food Pantry in Philadelphia, Centro de Alabanza and their community in Philadelphia, as well as some other South Philly churches that Aldo is working with. Um, When this process started a few weeks ago, uh, it began with uh, the Ripple Community Inc. Um, one of the few places still open in Allentown. Um, As other services and shelters have closed, they have said, if we don't stay open, if we don't help, who will? Um, And they had a need for 300 sandwiches two times a week. Um, And through this process was able to work amazingly. And they've been so helpful with Landis Supermarket. They are providing uh, individually wrapped and ready to go 300 sandwiches for $300 two times a week. and even just as this started, we did not know where the, where the funds exactly, how long we'd be able to fund this. Not that we still don't know, but um, um, so we're moving forward with that. And it's been great to see um, people supporting that. And uh, from there, it's grown to more needs, more um, longer term looking at things, what, what might be needed for our communities. As, If we can provide food, then it's a more of a chance and more of a likelihood that folks will be able to make a mortgage payment or um, get their prescription or whatever may be needed uh, to sustain life. Uh, If we can help provide and ease the burden of food in some way. Um, So some things that are happening is we've had 200 deodorants and 240 bars of soap being mailed up to Ripple. Um, I have currently have 300 pound, 3,000 pounds of yard and canned jalapenos out in a warehouse in Lancaster that I will have a volunteer truck driver, a pickup truck driver, um, take into Centro de Alabanza on Monday, um, plus pallets of water, noodles, um, 40 pound boxes of produce that's ready to go um, to families and to banks. Um, So one of the stories I wanted to share with you guys actually has to do with these 40 pound boxes that I just found out about like three days ago. and as I learned more about them, learned that they might work for our context, I uh, contacted Antonio at Central de Alabanza 
Uh, and I said, Antonio, I have access to these 35, 40 pound boxes. Um, is this something that will work in your context? Um, and he said, um, yeah, they would work. work. Uh, I think we could really use those. And I said, how many, you know, how many are you needing? How many can we get you? Um, and he said, well, his response was, was more along the lines of, well, he'd need to do some figuring just on the funds, what, what they could do. And um, thanks to the Shalom Fund, to our community, um, that was really working like the community in action right now, I, uh, my reply was, and I'll just read it. Um, I said, um, this would be funded through the Shalom Fund coming through the church conference. Our brothers and sisters who are still working are donating funds to those who, who cannot right now. Um, so don't, I was able to say, so don't think about the cost. Tell me how much you need. Tell me what the real need is and um, just trust our community and trust um, that God is providing and, and we're going to get it where it needs to go. Um, and <laughs> he was blown away and I was even just blown away and um, teared up a little. And if I talk about it too much now, I'll tear up again. Uh, just to see that um, our community here, you guys, my brothers and sisters, are, are um, um, no matter what end of it you are on, you are working as part of this X community um, where there is a need, we are working together to fill it. Um, and whether that's through supporting the Shalom Fund so that folks can have food, um, whether it's through driving your truck, um, to get the food from point A to point B um, are very specific examples that I'm working with, but there are um, many others out there. And um, I just wanna say thank you. And um, yeah, this has been amazing to do and to see, and um, God's not done yet. And the Holy Spirit is working in amazing ways that it's so fun to see and be a part of for me and just this very small piece that I'm doing. And, um, you guys are doing. Thank you, Brooke, for the amazing work you are doing, for being a bridge between these different communities so that we can care for one another in such tangible ways, and for sharing the stories with us. I know Antonio. I used to work with him at Centro de Alabanza, and it's so moving to me every time I hear the story of the need and the grace of God that we can respond to it. I should say too, if you would like more information about the Shalom Fund, please do check out the newsletter and videos on the conference Facebook page. The conference has heard of immediate needs for food and basic necessities already in the range of $50,000. And that's just from the first few weeks of shutdown. These needs are from people who have no safety net, have not been able to afford a backup plan, some of whom who are undocumented and will not be receiving stimulus checks. So the need is real and immediate, and it's all being distributed through our sister congregations in Eastern District and Franconia Conference. We are all a part of this work, because of the donation that Salford has made to this fund. We are part of demonstrating the good news of the resurrection in this way. And there are other ways to be part of the sharing that is happening right now as well. Most of us will be receiving substantial checks from the government in the coming weeks. For those of us who are financially stable and still receiving paychecks, the money may not be as urgently needed as it is for others. If you are one of those families, we're encouraging you to consider how that money can be a sign of the resurrection for someone who does urgently need it. The Salford congregation would like to match the donation to the Shalom Fund we've already made with another $12,500 of individual donations so that we can bless those communities who are facing serious immediate challenges even more. So if this is possible for you, please consider how Jesus might be breathing the Holy Spirit on you 
giving you peace and calling you to spread the good news. And check the newsletter for specifics. And if this stimulus money is needed in your household, may you accept it as good news. And may it be a part of the peace that Jesus is offering you. Okay, but sharing money isn't the only way that Jesus calls us to and empowers us in these days of the resurrection. There are so many everyday ways of being the body of Christ that are already happening. Whether it's waving to your neighbor and asking how they're doing across the fence, putting a rainbow in your window. I know some of you have already done that. Sewing face masks, sending postcards. All these are evidence of Jesus' presence and the empowering nature of the Holy Spirit. And all of them are ways that we are going forth, not physically, but just as meaningfully into the world to proclaim that Jesus is alive and at work, even now, while death is so very real. This week, I posted a kindness bingo game for the senior high. It's on the Salford webpage on the Church at Home Resources page. Everything on it is something a youth can do with household materials while maintaining social distancing. I told the youth that there would be prizes. For any adults who complete a bingo, I'd love to celebrate you as well, though I am reserving the nicer prizes for the youth. So you might be getting to this point in the sermon and feeling exhausted. This pandemic has been demanding so much of us at a time when our reserves are so limited and everything takes more energy, more breaks, more time. If you are feeling the burden of this time, especially if you are someone who already struggles with mental health challenges or past trauma, it may be all you can do to get up in the morning, much less make masks or do kindness bingo. And this is why I am so thankful that our God is a God of creativity and compassion, and the good news is adaptable enough to slip into the tiniest crevices in the world and enliven the most desolate places. So I want to tell you about what is probably the first way Jesus empowers us in the resurrection, but I'm saying it last because I want it to stick with you the longest. Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit on us and empowers us to be evidence of God's reign in this world. And that starts with our hearts, our own hearts and our own human bodies. Here, where our patterns are disrupted, we have the opportunity, and frankly, a need, to live in the way of God's reign like never before. And this means rejecting the evil messages that say you're not worthy of God's love or someone else is not worthy. It means rejecting consumerism, which is rooted in a need to have more stuff in order to be content and practicing the radical idea that you were created good and God already desires good for you. It means slowing down so that rather than being burdened and distracted by many things, we can appreciate what God has already given us and be part of God's creative process. It might mean looking at the news less. Can you, by worrying and checking the news, add so much as a single hour to your life? It means creating beauty. All of us are capable of that. When we create, we are echoing our creator who made us in her image. When we do these things, we begin to live and act out of God's abundance. God's overflowing resurrection, which spreads life, 
rather than acting out of scarcity and fear. It starts with accepting God's compassion for you, which is even more tender now as God knows what we're up against. For this resurrection to have a real impact in the world, we must first know it in our bodies. That's why Jesus started with saying, do not be afraid. That's why second he breathed the Holy Spirit on the disciples. And only after that did he give them a charge. Only when they were already overflowing with God's goodness and hope were they ready to go out into the suffering world. So our first step must be to know and live the good news that the resurrection is real. Whatever that looks like for you, please do it, knowing that it is a central part of God's good news for today. And then let it overflow. Let it go out into the world. First Peter, which Sienna read, says in part that it's in suffering that our true faith is revealed. This pandemic certainly is revealing a lot. One of the things it's revealing is the depth of generosity. If we have eyes to see, this pandemic is revealing the goodness that people can show one another. The goodness that ultimately points to our creator who made us good from the very beginning and is still at work amid life, amid death, amid resurrection. May we have eyes to see. May we take courage as Jesus breathes it into us. And may we take up the calling that Jesus has placed on us and walk into the suffering world empowered by the resurrection. May it be so. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. 
Gracious and loving God, into the storm bring your peace. For those who are in the midst of the tumult of cancer and treatments for it, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are in the midst of mental health struggles, the weariness and uncertainty, anxious thoughts and runaway feelings that press upon them, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Into the storm, bring your peace, O God. For those who have been infected with COVID-19 or are accompanying family members ill with it or have lost beloved ones because of it, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have lost loved ones this week, whatever the cause, we pray your comfort and tender care. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have lost jobs, who own small businesses, who are wondering how to make financial resources stretch, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For the Salford Mennonite Child Care Center ministry team, administration, teachers and families as they navigate together through these financially uncertain times. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Into the storm, bring your peace. Make us instruments to bring your peace. Grow in us the practice of deep gratitude for what we do have. We give you thanks and praise for the new lives of Ian Rohr and Caleb Zetz. Bless their parents with strength and wisdom, joy and patience as they nurture these little ones. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Teach us what is ours to give and how to share, even in the midst of these challenging times. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. And now we bring to you the unspoken cries of our hearts, O oh God, as we lift to you those people and situations for whom we especially want to pray today. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Send us, Lord, to bring your peace as we cling to the rock that is you in the midst of this storm. Amen. My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentation I catch the sweet though far off in That hails a new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from of Christ makes fresh my heart, a fountain never springing. All things are mine since I am his. How can I keep from singing? No storm can shake my inmost calm. While to that rock I'm clinging, since love is Lord of heaven and earth, 
How can I keep from singing? Though we cannot see each other, though we cannot share in person our smiles and hugs and handshakes, it has truly been good to be together this morning, even in this way. So now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through all that lies ahead. Amen. Be well, beloved community.